and feel free to interrupt too. We also have Agnes here, and she is the stroke program coordinator. She runs the whole show. Um, my name's Jill Garrett. I'm a nurse practitioner. I run the outpatient stroke and TIA prevention clinic where I see patients who've been admitted um, or have been through the emergency room who've had a stroke or a transient ischemic attack and go through stroke education. Our goal in Sarasota is that everybody knows how to recognize the signs of a stroke. And uh, there's a little acronym called FAST, and this program is actually put on by the National Stroke Association. Come on, come up. Interrupt me. Um, and so after today's program, if you go and you tell at least one other person how to recognize a stroke and explain the FAST acronym to them, uh, we'll get to our goal a lot quicker. Has anyone heard of the um, FAST acronym, F-A-S-T? Has anyone, you've heard of it? You know. So, ah, so you're the expert. Um, so uh, this just explains a little about, about your, your brain. You all know what your brain controls everything that you do. And right side of brain, left side of the brain. made up of more than 100 billion um, nerves. When you have a stroke, you lose um, ab about 2 million brain cells a minute. So that's why it's important to get treatment quickly. Stroke is like a heart attack. We want people to treat it like a heart attack. Um, most people now, when they're having chest pain, call 911. So that's why it's important that we recognize the stroke. Um, not as many people die from stroke now. We're fortunate it's dropped down to the fifth leading cause of death, but it is the highest cause of disability. And the disability can range from not being able to move one side. I think that's mostly how we think about stroke patients, um, but it can also affect vision, speech, memory, um, cognitive function, uh, emotions. Some people become depressed. And so you can imagine if your hobbies or your work entails around speech or vision, it, it has a huge impact. So um, risk factors for stroke, more um, women are somewhat protected up until menopause. And after menopause, we're kind of even with men. Uh, unfortunately, women do not fare as well as men after they've had a stroke. Several reasons for that, I think perhaps we are used to being the caregivers, and so we don't take care of ourselves. We're used to taking care of our husbands and, and children, uh, and also hormones affect it too. Um, uh, risk factors that you can't control are already having had a stroke or a TIA, uh, family history of stroke or TIA, you can't control those. Getting older, you can't control, but it beats the alternative. And, um, but the good news is that 80% of strokes are preventable. Eighty. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so, can anyone tell me what a stroke is? Out Eighty. I'm going to go into that. Eighty percent of strokes are preventable with a few lifestyle changes. Yep. Um, I'll go into that. So um, everybody know what a stroke is? A, a stroke is a sudden blockage of one of the blood vessels in the brain. Uh, and it shuts off the blood supply to that part of the brain. Symptoms of a stroke are dependent on where uh, that blockage is. So 95% of people, their speech center is on the left. So if you have a stroke on the left, that's going to affect your speech. If you have a stroke in the back of the brain, that controls vision and balance that's where you'll lose vision. So it depends where the stroke is as to what symptoms you will have. A stroke is an emergency. Uh, we recommend that people call EMS and call 911. Uh, when you call 911, the emergency room is given a heads up and you come in as what's called a stroke alert. And if you're interested, we can tell you more about that. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And that's interesting because sometimes people have vertigo symptoms, which is dizziness, nausea, vomiting, and it might just be plain vertigo, which is a, a mid middle ear thing, but it can also be symptoms of a stroke. And so you don't know unless you come to the emergency room and you, you get your scan. Yeah, it is frightening. There are two types of stroke. Um, the most common stroke is, is what's called an ischemic stroke, and that is where a little tiny piece of plaque um, or a little piece of blood clot breaks off, travels up from the heart or the carotid arteries up into the, up into the brain, uh, and shuts off blood supply to that part of the brain. That part of the brain dies. There's an area around the area of uh, dead brain um, that is potentially viable, that has a medical term, it's called perumba, and if you get treatment quickly, that part of the, we can prevent that part of the brain dying. 20 uh, so 80% of strokes are, roughly 80% of strokes are ischemic, um, that's the most common, um, and that's uh, from high blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, uh, the other 20% are from uh, hemorrhagic stroke, which is bleeding into the brain or around the brain. Um, uh, sometimes bleeding uh, into the brain or around the brain is caused by trauma, a fall, uh, aneurysms, which is a weakness in the blood vessel wall, or malformations of different uh, of, of the arteries. So why learn fast? We want to save a life, whether it's yours or um, a neighbor's. Uh, I had a patient in the clinic who uh, lives in a retirement place, and somebody came and talked about FAST, and he, they gave him a fridge sticker, and uh, about three months later, he got out of bed, and his leg didn't feel quite right, and he went to the mirror, he looked in the mirror, and his face was lopsided. He went to say something to himself and found he couldn't speak. His wife was asleep. He went to the uh, fridge, took the sticker, pointed to 911, and the fast and woke her up. And so if somebody hadn't been there three months before to um, teach him the signs of stroke, he, he would have missed it. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I had a patient in the clinic who received um, a letter from the American Heart Association because heart also, um, American Heart Association also covers brain. And on one side of the card, just like this, were signs of a heart attack. On the other side, uh, was signs of a stroke. And he was walking to work, got chest pain, um, realized he was having a heart attack, came to the hospital, and was here four days, had uh, stents put in. Um, and un unfortunately, three weeks later, he was going to, he was making his wife breakfast. He couldn't move his, his leg felt as if it didn't belong to him, and he had to lean against the, the sink. And he still had the card on the counter and told his wife that he thought he was having a stroke. So he used both sides of the car at that time. So that's why it's important to recognize the, the signs. Very easy to remember. FAST, mean, FAST um, was developed in England in 1989. It was a way to educate ambulance drivers and support staff on how to recognize a stroke, and it has kind of grown. So, um, and this is gonna be on your post-test, so um, can you tell me what F stands for? Okay, right. So if you think someone is having a stroke, ask them to smile, show their teeth, uh, and stick out their tongue. Uh, a is arms. You have um, somebody put both arms out, palms uh, facing the floor, about shoulder height. If you're not able to keep the arms up together, one keeps dropping down, you call 911. I had a patient uh, in the clinic who was unfortunately driving, tried to do that, and when he went into his pocket to get his cell phone, he realized that he, he couldn't move his hand. So S is speech, say a sentence out loud. Um, a lot of people in, in Sarasota live alone, so you want to say something out loud. Uh, I had a, a patient in the clinic who was coming in for a, a mammogram, um, left the house, of course didn't talk to anybody, and it wasn't until she went to ask direct for directions for when the, where the mammography uh, unit was that she realized that she couldn't speak. 
um, I had another lady in the clinic who went about her morning. When she went to say something to, to the dog, she realized then that her words were gobbled. So <laughs> say a sentence out loud. Uh, T is time. It means call 911, activate EMS. Um, it also means, if you can, pay attention to the time because when you come to the emergency room, the emergency physician and the neurologist are going to question you on when the symptoms started. And that is really important because we, well, hopefully somebody is with you. But we, that, we, that does happen. Yeah, Agnes can tell you more about that. And that, is, that makes it a lot harder for us to, to get a history on that timeline. We have um, three hours from the time that the symptoms of stroke started to giving you a medicine called TPA, which is a clot-busting medication. It has been shown to reduce disability by about 30%, which is it's huge. And so that is our goal. When you hit the emergency room, we want to be able to give you that medication within 60 minutes of you arriving. So it's in really important for us to know when your symptoms started. When did somebody last see you, um, last see you normal? So sometimes it might be 11 o'clock at night, you watch the news, go to bed, and you wake up at 7 with um, leg weakness or not able to speak, and it's not clear um, when those symptoms start. Did it start shortly after you went to sleep or right before you woke up? So we, but then if we probe and prod, sometimes we can find out that someone got up at, at five in the morning to go to the bathroom and they were perfectly fine. So time is, is really of the, of the essence. That was right. Sounds great, though. Um, so uh, there are other symptoms of stroke. Uh, I had one lady whose son had had a stroke and, and uh, several months later, hi, join us. Um, uh, she had a stroke and for some reason she thought you had to have all of the symptoms and so she delayed getting treatment. So you do not have to have all of the symptoms. Um, but uh, symptoms of stroke are sudden. You're going around about your normal business and the stroke, um, which is why it's called a stroke, stops you in your tracks. So sudden severe headache, unlike any headache you've had, sudden um, confusion, sudden garbled speech, um, sudden loss of vision or vision field cut. I had a patient who was watching TV and all of a sudden part of the TV disappeared. Um, sudden numbness or weakness on one side of the body. Uh, some people, as I said, have um, dizziness uh, or, or nausea, vomiting. So um, there are other, other symptoms of a stroke. Like, and again, it, it says up there, if you experience one or more of the symptoms, call 911. We're fortunate in this area that we have a lot of that. I think all of the hospitals here can give TPA, which is the clot-busting drug, um, because hospitals have to be certified. Um, that's a good question. There's um, a, about a 6% chance of bleeding with the, with the drug. So certain people are excluded. It can only be given for ischemic strokes. It cannot be given for a hemorrhagic stroke. And that is the reason that you go to the CT scanner first. And they, the CT is very sensitive to blood. If it picks up blood in the brain, then you're not eligible for the TPA. And there are other, some other exclusions of receiving TPA, but it's best if you just get to the hospital and, and let the um, neurologist figure that out. Yeah, you're very closely watched. You go to the neuro, the neuro intensive care unit, and then you have a CAT scan 24 hours later. So, um, if it was me, I would want to get the medication. People get better really, really quickly. So it's not effective in everybody. Um, sometimes, if the stroke is small, you won't you won't see as much improvement. But we've had people who are totally paralyzed on one side and then several minutes later they're able to, m to move, to regain some function. So, If you're not able to receive TPA, there are other uh, interventions that they can do. Um, we have an interventional radiologist uh, on site who um, can go in, thread a catheter, 
from the groin up into the brain and actually pull the blood clots out if, if the stroke is in a, big, in, in a large blood vessel. So we, we have a few other options. So. Um, so a TIA is a transient ischemic attack. Um, some people call it mini stroke. It has the same symptoms as a stroke, um, but the symptoms generally disappear within, uh, within a few minutes. They're always gone within 24 hours. Um, people take that as a good sign. They're, they're fine. I saw a patient in the hospital yesterday who said he felt like a fraud because he was perfectly fine. It's actually a warning sign um, that a stroke could be looming around the corner. And people who have T TIAs are more at risk of having a stroke within the first 72 hours, which is why we have the clinic, because we can expedite workup. Um, and then within the first month and three months, and then it sort of goes down over the year. Over the, but it's, very, it's a very serious um, uh, symptom. You cannot see a TIA on a scan. Uh, you go by how the patient presents. The opposite side of your brain controls the opposite side of your body. So if you have a stroke on the left, you'll have symptoms on the right and vice versa. Um, how much effect of the stroke is dependent on what area and how large an area is affected. So um, everyone is at risk for stroke. Um, increases as you get older, so after the age of 55, which I don't consider old, but 10% um, of strokes happen in teenagers, and my son was 19 when he had a stroke. Um, strokes happen in babies, um, so ah. Yeah, you tend to think of it as being something that happens as you get older. But in the clinic, I see lots and lots of people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s who've had a stroke. I don't know if it's more than we used to. I think we pick it up quicker. And maybe, um, you know, people don't pay as much of attention to their diet and exercise as perhaps they could and end up with high blood pressure, diabetes, being overweight, all of which are risk factors for stroke. Smoking is a big one. Smoking is huge. Also, um, ethnicity. So African Americans have more strokes. Um, they tend to be um, more prone to high blood pressure uh, and, and so a lot of ischemic strokes, whereas um, Asian population have tend to have more um, hemorrhagic strokes. So ethnicity also plays a role. Um, do I have do, on your depending on your ethnicity? Because they're more prone to high blood pressure. That's just that's how their DNA turned out. So it's like we always joke and say, you know, be careful who you choose as parents because you're going to get their 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 DNA. So the number one reason for both strokes is high blood pressure. Um, we have blood pressure machines here, so you can check your blood pressures before you leave. Uh, sometimes people don't know they have high blood pressure. Sometimes they do know they have high blood pressure and may not be good about taking their medication, run out the door, go off without taking it. Um, sometimes people go on, decide to change their, their lifestyle, lose weight, exercise, are able to come off of their blood pressure and their diabetes medicines. Life kicks in, stresses of life kicks in. They gain the weight back, um, plus probably a little bit more, but neglect to go back to the doctor to restart their, their medication. We see that a lot. So... We want to keep the blood pressure. Optimum blood pressure is 120 over 80. After a stroke, we like to keep you um, less than 130 over 90. So if you, yeah, if you if you consistently having a blood pressure in the 140s, uh, 150s, 160s, 
140 and you go to your doctor, that's the top number, the systolic number, they'll recommend lifestyle changes such as losing weight, cutting out salt, uh, exercising regularly. If that's not enough and your blood pressure is creeping up, they'll, they'll add medication. And very often people are on more than one medication to control their blood pressure. So if you have a systolic blood pressure of 160, you're likely to need you know, two, maybe three medications to get your blood pressure low. So generally after, if someone is in the hospital with a stroke, their blood pressure is higher, we let them ride a little bit higher to, to protect their brain uh, and help it perfuse. And then after a couple of weeks, we, we um, trend it down slowly. That is true, if it's too low. Too low would be um, probably some, like some 80 over, s over something. So, um, and those strokes, that, that, that's hypoperfusion. You're not getting enough blood to the brain. But that, doesn't ha that, is, that is much less common than having high blood pressure. Yeah. Uh, it depends. People tolerate things differently. So uh, if, it's, if it's slow, probably not as bad, but if it's sudden, that's, you know, if it's a sudden drop for whatever reason, um, you know, they're bleeding or um, they're diabetic or something, then that's, that's key. High blood pressure happens over, over time. As we get older, the arteries get stiffer. The baroreceptors aren't as, um, as um, effective at working, and, that's w and family history also, that's why people have high blood pressure. Um, diabetes, uh, people with diabetes are more likely to have stroke. Um, the high sugars affect the lining of the blood vessels and increase plaque buildup. Plaque is that waxy substance, and I have pictures in the back there um, if you want to look at it. That builds up in the, in, the, um, in the blood vessels, especially in the, we think of the blood vessels around the carotid for stroke and in the heart. We need cholesterol. We get enough cholesterol from our diet. And if you have too much, you're going to build it up. Atrial fibrillation. Has everybody heard of atrial fibrillation? It's an arrhythmia. It's an irregular heartbeat. Um, if you have atrial fibrillation, you are five times uh, more likely to have a stroke. Um, little uh, tiny fragments of blood clots can get shot out into the brain. Atrial fibrillation can be tricky to pick up. Um, because some people go in and out of it um, so briefly that they don't have any symptoms. Whereas if it's sustained, they might have chest pains, um, shortness of breath. Um, and so we, um, we monitor for that when someone comes into the hospital. And it, when you go to your doctors for your wellness exam, uh, an EKG it might not be long enough to pick up atrial fibrillation because that's just a snapshot in time. When you come to the hospital, most people with TIAs or strokes are in for two or three days. Um, that might not be enough to pick it up. If uh, suspicion for atrial fibrillation is high, then um, we recommend an event monitor, which can monitor you for two to four weeks done through your cardiologist. Sometimes that's not enough. And we now have a little um, device that's the size of a hair clip that they put under the skin. Uh, it's called a link device, and that can monitor you for three years. Um, we, people who have atrial fibrillation, um, aspirin is not enough to protect them. They need full anticoagulation. Smoking, as I said, is, is huge. Um, if anyone is here smoked and uh, would like to quit, the new year is coming up. Um, Health Connections does have a uh, tobacco cessation class, uh, and the whole schedule is back there. also very hard. The people that I see repeatedly in the clinic are the, are the people that have had a lot of difficulties not smoking. I saw a young girl yesterday. Alcohol use, if, you, if you're a um, heavy drinker, moderate alcohol is recommended, which is one drink uh, a day for a woman and two for a man. One drink is five ounces of wine, 12 ounces of beer, or ounce, I never remember if it's an ounce or an ounce and a half of spirits, since I don't drink spirits. Um, and you can't save them up and all ha have them all on one day either. So, Yep, 
Yeah. They say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's very addictive. No. No. Ah. And did he quit? No. Oh, good. Uh, it does. It re reduces greatly your um, risk of having a heart attack or a stroke. Doesn't quite diminish the the cancer risk, but it's still, a, yeah. But regarding strokes and heart attacks, yes, certainly. If you smoke, you're more at risk for really everything: bladder cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer. It's really sad when you see young people um, smoking these days. Um, so this is the big one, and this is like never popular when we talk about this at the clinic. Um, physical activity um, is recommended exercise is 30 minutes a day. Uh, I know Agnes gets it because she does her spin class. <laughs> um, and I, ha I, I hear lots of reasons in the clinic why somebody can't exercise. Um, but that is our goal when they walk out, that they have a plan. Um, to whoops. Broke the equipment. Um, uh, that they have an exercise goal. So, does everybody in here exercise? Do some kind of form of exercise? Oh, good. What do you do? Swimming. Perfect. Swimming is great aerobic. So, the, we are supposed to take 10,000 steps a day. Um, we want to be active. Um, but also incorporate some aerobic activity in it. And swimming is great. Um, bicycling, walking briskly. Um, when, uh, <coughs> yeah, well, swimming is perfect. There's, there's always something for everybody, you know. Um, if somebody, I see a lot of people who don't exercise, and so we start them off on a walking program, and I tell them just to put on a pair of shoes, take a bottle of water and walk out the door. Walk for five minutes, turn around, and walk back home quicker than you, than you went. And then you do that every day for a week, and uh, you add five minutes every week. Five minutes a day every week. So um, by the end of six weeks, hopefully you're up it to the 30 minutes. Um, we have um, a couple of programs here for exercise, and I can give you info on that. Um, diet is um, equally important. Uh, we don't quite so much recommend the low-fat diets anymore because th there are certain fats that are good for us. They protect our brain and they protect our heart. So um, the Mediterranean diet, if you incorporate aspects of it, which is um, uh, using olive oil, uh, eating foods um, higher in the good fats, Won't clip in my pen. Oh, I've got it. Got it? Yeah. Um, so the good fats are avocado, nuts like almonds, walnuts, pecans. Uh, they recommend uh, cold water fish like salmon, uh, trout, uh, tuna twice a week. Uh, avoid red meat. Avoid um, saturated fat, um, which is in marble meats, bacon, sausage, that kind of thing. The thing I get um, a lot of pushback for in the clinic when I see patients is that they recommend that we eat five servings of fruits and vegetables a day. And that is the hardest, I think, for everybody. Um, I had one lady who said that certainly can't be right. It has to be once a week. And no. Even people that exercise regularly have a hard time getting in their five servings of fruits and vegetables. So um, that's always my goal when I wake up. Okay, I'm going to get my five servings of fruits and vegetables. So a serving of... Um, Vegetables, one cup of raw is considered a serving, half a cup of cooked. Uh, and it's not that hard. So a medium-sized apple, a banana about the size of a pen is considered one serving, uh, a cup of strawberries. Blueberries are very good for your brain. Um, also drink plenty of water. And generally when you shop, shop around the perimeter of the uh, grocery store. Skip the aisles where all the packaged food are. Processed food is the enemy. 
It's, um, and skip the bakery, which is on the outside too. Um, processed food is the enemy. It's the processed foods high in salt, high in sugar, high in fat, um, high fructose corn syrup. Um, and, and if you ever try to, to eat for a whole week and not use anything in a package, it is actually quite challenging. So um, know the signs of fast, act fast. And this is, an, this is another favor of mine. It's another acronym, and it's, it's DFAST, which I think is kind of even better. Uh, and it gives you a couple more stroke symptoms. So B is balance, uh, and I is eyes. You know, I talked about where you lose vision. So, um, but if you remember the signs of FAST. Face, arm, speech, time. Right? And they put on those. I think they should have actually put um, a picture of a two-year-old, because my granddaughter is two, and she's faster than that. <laughs> and our stroke alert. <laughs> Please. Okay, any questions? Want to add anything? That might be interesting for new stroke alert, how that runs. So on the other side, hopefully after this, you'll never have a stroke. But if you should happen to have a stroke or know anyone that has a stroke, you know from this that time is important. Getting in here to the hospital, try and call, I mean, definitely call EMS. Try not to drive in or have someone drive you in. Because EMS will notify us that you're coming in, that they think they have someone that has a stroke alert. We get a page in our beepers, and then we're down there waiting at the door when EMS come in because we know time is so important. We're trying to save as many brain cells as we can. So as soon as you come in with EMS, we meet you at the bay door inside the ambulance bay. We determine if it's a stroke alert or not. We do a qu very quick assessment. Take some blood work, we get you registered. We don't even take you to a room, and we go immediately to CAT scan. We do that to make sure you don't have a bleed, or you know, we check if you do have a bleed. But we want to make sure there's no bleed, which is why we do the CAT scan really quickly. And then we determine the best treatment for you while we're there. The neurologist comes down. He also gets the page. He meets us down. We have a stroke team in this hospital. So that's why when you come in, if there's a lot of people, it's the stroke team. And we're there. And we're there to get treatment established as quickly as possible because we know that we want to try and save as many brain cells as possible. So if we determine that you should get that blood, um, blood um, clotter, you know, declutter. So we'll determine if you get that, initiate that as quickly as possible. And then if we think that it's a certain type of stroke and you could do it having the clot um, pulled out, then we'll take you into radiology to our neurointerventionist. So we'll take you into radiology, do that quick um, angiogram, go up to the artery, See if there's a clot there, and he can pull that clot right out. So we act really, really fast and quick, and that's why we're, there's a big team, and we're ready to treat you as soon as we can. You have a stroke, you're here about three to four days. Rehab are involved, and all the therapies, and so um, they'll determine if you need to go to a rehab afterwards or not. And, and Sarasota Memorial is um, primary stroke certified and comprehensive certified, and I'll let Agnes explain that, because that's really an important criteria. Yeah, so that means that we offer a higher level of care than the other hospitals in our area. Um, we're a, there are primary stroke centers, we're a comprehensive stroke center, because we can offer all of those treatments. Neuro intervention is something that we definitely offer here that the other hospitals don't um, don't offer. But they send us patients that need that from other hospitals. So we do get transfers in from all the other hospitals in the region. They'll have that procedure done, and we can send them out. But um, that is why we're known as the comprehensive center in the region. We also um, do what's called telestroke. So um, if in our remote location, down in North Fort Reserve, or if it's after hours, the neurologist can actually examine the patient, um, kind of almost like um, FaceTiming somebody, uh, and uh, discuss with the ER physician whether that patient meets criteria to receive TPA. And yes. 
So we can go on a camera up here and do the assessment to the camera. And actually patients and family like, like us, so they get pretty comfortable and you know, we can talk to them, ask the same questions that we would if we were doing a face do that with a couple of hospitals. You can initiate that treatment, give the same standard of care as if you came in here, and then the patient is usually flown to us. So we treat them. The device Jill was talking about, you know, for the heart rate for the monitoring. Oh, good, thanks, I forgot to show you. Yeah, it's in here, it's tiny. But um, it's called, the, it's Link, and that's only one device that's used out in the market. And it's like a tag that's put in down here on the fourth intercostal space that goes under the skin. I send it around, it's really tiny. And then it's wirelessly transmitted the information and we, to the company, to us, and we can access your heart rate um, from this device. But you see how small it is? I know, it's amazing. So we were able to tell someone who was playing golf in Hawaii last month that they were had an irregular heart rate and they needed to go and get on, <laughs> get treatment. Technology is definitely changing all the time. I know. I know. So it means that they, people don't have to wear those halter monitors and all those leads anymore. You can just um, put this in. Those are used in patients who have cryptogenic strokes and we don't really know why they have the stroke. So we'll put that in and you know they're on a monitor when they're in here. We don't see that atrial fibrillation. We, we presume that's probably why they've had the stroke. So the cardiologist is involved, they'll put that in. We work with the cardiologist and we try over time to determine if they have atrial fib so that we can prevent them from having another stroke. We've been using that now a couple of years. Yeah, and actually this is another one that's out. It's a temporary one. It looks like a Band-Aid. And so if we have temporary cardiac monitoring when a patient goes home, this is much shorter. And, you know, we're starting to look at this now. So there's a lot of new devices becoming available. And that's one thing. When you come in with a stroke or a TIA, we always look for the reason that you had the stroke, um, whether it's blood pressure, cholesterol, atrial fibrillation, because that way we can we can um, help help prevent you having another stroke. So um, that's key for us because you're more susceptible for having another stroke if you've had one, and we want to always prevent you coming back in with another stroke. I don't know if were they clogged or they were just they were just small. So risk factors of stroke, blood pressure, smoking, diabetes, cholesterol. Uh, atrial fibrillation. I didn't mention sleep apnea, but sleep apnea is a big one. Uh, it's an independent risk factor regardless of whether you have other risk factors for stroke. Sleep apnea, um, le where people stop breathing, have obstructive breathing, stop breathing hundreds of times during the night, uh, increases blood pressure and causes arrhythmias. Um, and so we are now uh, looking more at sleep apnea too. Um, Diet, exercise, which we, we touched on, those are all ways that you can prevent having a stroke or a heart attack because whatever you do for your heart, you do for your brain and vice versa. I actually have sleep apnea if you are waking up frequently during the day and sleepy and tired during the day, if you snore a lot, there are usually signs that you have sleep apnea. People who, people who have sleep apnea tend to wake up and they're not as refreshed as if you've had a good night's sleep. Um, they fall asleep at unusual times where someone else, someone will be awake. So they might fall asleep um, after lunch if no alcohol is involved. They might fall asleep watching TV, reading a book. They might even fall asleep driving. Um, and so if you suspect that you have sleep apnea, 
um, you go to see your doctor and then you, you get sent for a sleep study. Yeah. Finally, we're getting to you. <laughs> done to have a totally diagnosed as oh. usually yeah it, that's the, the best way sometimes they will come out and they'll put the oxygen thing on your finger you know and see if your oxygen drops down into the night and that might indicate that you have just recommend that you follow up with a neurologist within a month after leaving just that they can work with you on you know have more time with with that physician and then a prevention of having another one we have a neurologist here all the time they're not in here they're on call and they're usually here within fifteen minutes. They, they take on call each time they're here for a week. So, you mean your general doctor? Oh yes, yes, yeah. Okay, I'll give you some. We'll talk about it after. Yeah, um, if you come into the hospital with a TIA or stroke, uh, a referral is generated. Um, and then I, I try to see everybody uh, for stroke education while they're in. Um, that, that's not 100%. And it is recommended that patients come to the clinic. It's a one-time follow-up. It takes about an hour for stroke education um, and understanding their risk factors and how to uh, control risk factors. Um, if, if someone was discharged and they, they didn't have a referral, that can be done through the primary care physician too. We recommend it, yeah, mm -hmm. for both. And uh, I have brochures here. Still, so we'll go over all the risk factors, and your medication. It kind of helps people because it's very hard to retain all that information when you're in the hospital. A lot going on, and it's, you always get those questions when you go home. So it's really nice to have that follow up with um, someone afterwards because you. I always say, write down all the questions that you have, and then you can think of them. And, the, and there are little things like, um, we, we do follow some patients, um, you know, every three months uh, that uh, don't have regular care or no insurance, et cetera. Um, but there are, there are little things that the, the clinic is helpful with. We go through medications, what they're for. People, um, a lot of times, as, as Agnes said, you get a lot of information in the hospital. You may not understand why aspirin is... is um, so important to you because it's just over the counter. It's actually um, considered a life-saving medication if you've had a stroke, uh, a as well as the cholesterol-lowering medications and blood pressure medications. And you know, there's so much press about some of the, the statin drugs, which are the cholesterol drugs. People are afraid, so we got we spend a lot of time on that. We also have um, two support stroke support groups. One is pure stroke support where patients who've had a stroke and or their families meet, and that's the first Wednesday of the month. That's up on Rand, which is just off Clark Road. That's where HealthFit is. Uh, and then the second Wednesday of the month, which happens to be today, uh, we have Stroke Wellness, uh, which is uh, lifelong education for stroke. Um, uh, sometimes people who've had a stroke think they know everything about stroke because they've had a stroke, and they certainly know a lot. But we, Agnes and I are still learning. Dr. Concha is still learning. He's, he's done the stroke program. Um, and there are always things that are changing. So, um, and that is on the fourth floor here near Winner's Cafeteria at one o'clock. Today it's exercise. If anyone wants to hang around, <laughs> go to lunch, get your fruits and vegetables and come up.
So if we could just ask you, if you could fill in that pre and post questionnaire, because this is a new program from the National Stroke Association. They'd like us to give us that feedback to see how effective it is. So it just helps us improve programs as we go along. That's the post change. Yeah. So. And then um, we'll be around. So if you have any questions, um, you know, free to ask. Thank you. Thank you for coming today.